first thing I want to tell you is, what is IGEO? What, what's our prime function here in the beautiful city of Uptown Smyrna, Georgia? Is primarily not, this has come from the Holy Ghost to me, your job is not to maintain faith. Your job is to empower it. Our job as a ministry is not to maintain people in their nice little comfort zone where everybody's happy, nobody gets offended, nobody gets... Well, you know, it's always going to happen, isn't it? It's always going to happen. People get offended. Jesus said, in this world, you'll suffer tribulation mainly because of your own families, those that you love. Turn their back on you. Church members, they say, oh, I love the Lord so much. Well, where are they? They took off. So remember this. Your job, my job, our job here at IGL is to empower the faith that God has given you by increasing it. Amen. By turning up the dial. Amen? Amen? All right. Now, I want to take you to a story, which is what God spoke to me this morning. Amos 3.7 says this. Surely the Lord will do nothing, but he revealeth his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Yes. They say, well, that was... They explained that to me in the old church of Christ. Oh, the prophets are gone. There's no healing anymore. Well, what's the point of going to the house of the Lord then? Why should I serve a God that doesn't return and show me his love for me? A stupidity. Prophets are around today. Apostles are around today. Read the book of Acts, it'll tell you. The prophets were continually instituted after Jesus Christ's resurrection. He had to, because that's the foundational, functional ability, the, the corporate ability of the house of God is through the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Without those, we have no functional ability. Everybody doing their own thing doesn't work. God's house is a house of order and discipline. This world is going to hell in a handbasket literally because the, the body of Christ has abjugated its authority. And that's what we're going to talk about, the stirring up of the gift that is in you. We're going to pray for you. I encourage every, more people to be here. Because your powerlessness is your own choice. It's not because God has singled out certain people to be your overseers. We have to go through more than you in order to be able to lead you. Do you hear me? Yes. Those that God has apportioned to be overseers in the house go through more than you in order to be qualified to lead you anywhere. Look at all the great leaders of the paper of Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Jesus. They all suffered. Why? So that they'd know how to help you, not to avoid suffering, but to understand it. You glad I'm back? Yes. <laughs> Nothing will he do until he... So we understand that the word of the Lord to the prophets and the apostles, because most apostles are prophets, they go through a training period, they will ultimately bring you to a place where you have understanding in the times in which we live, like Ishakar was in the tribes of Israel. They had an understanding of things which were yet to be. Now, in Genesis chapter 19, as a bit of your homework... I want you to read the whole of Genesis 19 because it says a lot about what's going on in the church. This is what the Lord was showing me this morning at 6.06 or 6.05. The story of Sodom and Gomorrah. We're living in it. Do you know that? You sure? You're living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, Lot, who was Abram's nephew, never made any real decisions for himself because he was somewhat undecided about just about everything. But he was smart enough to look at Abram and say, Phew, everything goes right for this man. My uncle, he's got his act together. And it says in the book of Genesis that Lot joined himself to Abram and off they went. They got blessed and the, they had to split up because they've, 
All of the blessing that Lot inherited was because of the walk of faith that Abraham, his uncle, had. Yeah. Now, I want you to think, think, that, think about bloodlines. Bloodlines are what is the basis of our Christianity. The blood of God, Jesus Christ on that cross of God, the blood of God was in his veins. And that bloodline connects him to you and to me if we're truly born again. And it's that bloodline that gives you an inheritance. Because without a bloodline, you're not an inheritor. That's the difference between a slave and a son. The son has a right to an inheritance. But what the Lord was showing me was that even though Lot had an inheritance, it was not his own directly from God. He got it indirectly through his uncle, Abram. Yeah. And if you read the story as it goes through in Genesis 19, I want you to read the whole story. I've had time I preach it all today, but we don't. But I want you to study it because we're going to hit on it again next week. Right. This story of Lot is incredibly insightful it's what the Holy Spirit told me today. Lot is the church today. We are living inside Sodom and Gomorrah. This world system is going bad, sideways, very hard left. Now, if you look at the, the reputation that Lot had within that city, you may not know this, but the word Lot means to conceal or to hide. His biggest failure as a man was that he never stood up for what he said he believed in. And interestingly enough, in Genesis 19, verse 1, you will see there that God tells us that he was not only in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, which appealed to him when he first saw it, because it reminded him of Eden. His idea of what Sodom and Gomorrah was was what God's garden looks like. Well watered, all of that. Decided he was going to move there with his family, had two daughters who eventually committed incest with him. His wife, who remains unnamed, interestingly enough, you can't find Lot's wife anywhere. People want to say, okay, so what? People want to know, what am I going to do now? What's happening next? Is the world going to come to an end? Am I going to starve to death? What about my babies? Can't even buy formula. They've got heaps of it in Mexico, heaps of it in storage places for the illegals to come in and swallow up. Meanwhile, the citizens of the United States of America are being abused on every front. You should be angry about this stuff. And just sit back and say, oh, it's a terrible thing. That's exactly what Lot did. Acts, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Genesis 19.1. Two angels came to Sodom in the evening. Now look at this. And Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. What does that mean? He was a city official. Lot had a position of governmental authority in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. Further on down the road, they said to him, we see you've got some strangers in your house. They didn't recognize them as angels. We've got some strangers. Bring them out that we may know them carnally, sexually. And what does Lot do? Oh, please, no, they're angels. God. But you can have my two virgin daughters. What kind of an animal does that? He was so weak, he couldn't even rise up and say, no, you don't. The angels had to pull him inside the house again. And then the angels struck these sodomites great word these sodomites with blindness so they were groping around in the darkness why because they were already in the darkness and they pulled Lot in by his arm and said get in here now you need to get out of this place because God has seen the wickedness in this city and judgment is coming if you remember, the Bible says, Peter says that in the last days, this world will be destroyed, not by water again, because God made a covenant, never do that again, right? But he says he will destroy it by fire, by heat. And he describes it as such that it actually describes 
nuclear war. These countries are eventually going to destroy themselves on their way down to destroy Israel. And it's interesting that it says that God is going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah by fire and brimstone. The sulfur pits upon which Sodom and Gomorrah were built caught fire. <laughs> sulfur is often referred to as the devil's salt. I don't know if you know that or not, but it's, it's used to make explosives. And Lot was told, you better get out and get out quickly. And take your wife and your two daughters with you. And it's, you know, the story, of course, when he actually got out of the city, his wife turned around because of her longing for Sodom and Gomorrah and its ways of life and turned to salt. When salt loses its savor and becomes rock salt, it loses its ability to preserve. The Lord showed me this morning that Sodom and Gomorrah is getting ready to happen again here in the United States because of one main thing. The moral degradation of this country. Now look, I'm the worst of all sinners. Believe me. I'm not sitting here preaching at you from a, a pious perspective of oh, I've always been a perfect person. I am not. I never, I never intended to, 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 to be that icon for you. But I will tell you this, that this country will pay a price for its moral degradation. And what was the main moral degradation in Sodom and Gomorrah? Homosexuality. Which is what's being pushed down our throats every day. And somehow you're out of order if you try to witness to somebody who's homosexual for sake that they may want to judge you or criticize. Let them judge you. I'm not the sodomite here. You are. What is a sodomite? Well, you go figure that out. And the government's, oh, yes, we turn our blind eye to that because what do they want? They want this whole country torn down because the evil that was in the city of Sodom and Gomorrah got God's attention. That's what the angel said. God has looked down upon this city. I could prophesy this uh, uh, right now, but I'm, I don't need to. I'm going to tell you. God has looked down and seen the degradation and the moral decay in this, in this city and he's going to destroy it. And America is in for trouble. Now you'd like to think everything's going to be hunky-dory in November. I pray to God we do get the Senate and the House of Representatives back in the right-hand column. I believe it will happen. But I've told you before, this is a window. I hesitate to I hesitate to say this to you, but the glory days of the United States of America are done. And because of our inactivity, it's being hastened. The next time somebody says to you, don't you like, homo don't you like homosexuals? Say, I love homosexuals, I don't like them. I want to help you, but I can't help you as long as you let that spirit take over your whole life and body and corrupt yourself and everybody around you. I'm so tired of turning on the TV and seeing men kissing each other. It turns my stomach. I'm sorry, it just does. Oh, you're a homophobe. The word homophobe means fearful of men. I'm not fearful of any man. So Trump, he said, I don't bow my knee to anybody but God. That takes guts to say that in this society. Well, what's going to be our end then? Sodom and Gomorrah, read Genesis 19. Your lives will be destroyed with fire and brimstone. The psalmist David said that if I go to the depths of the ocean, God is there. If I go to hell, he is there. Now, I looked at that. I said, I don't understand that. And the Holy Ghost said to me, if there were no God, there'd be no hell. And I thought, ooh, that's interesting. If there was no God, there'd be no heaven. So all the psalmist David was saying was, no matter, even if I go to hell itself, God is aware of it. And he's there. Too late once folks are there, unfortunately. 
although they get another chance apparently to repent but I say this to people who are look what they're doing to your children not your children by God's sake confusing little ones four and five years old as to whether they're a boy or a girl shame on you may the judgment of God come upon you these children are innocent they look to us to tell them how to think, what to do they go to mama when they want consolement you're not even allowed to call your mama anymore to hell with you and your racial inequality theories and your CRTs and all the rubbish that you're pumping into our young children's heads and hearts I tell them unless you repent you're going to hell oh I don't believe in hell that's, that's pretty obvious because you're living hell right now do you know the suicide rate amongst homosexuals is four times the national average God created you male and female. Don't be misled. Don't be lied to. Your little girls are little girls. Encourage them to be soft and tender and sweet. Tell your little boys to put up with it when they fall over and bust their leg. My mama, my mama used to patch me up, but she never said, oh, you poor little thing. She'd hear me screaming in the backyard because I fell over and I bashed my head. I had a big lump. I'll never forget this. In our backyard in my house in Australia, we had these little volcanic rocks to make like rock gardens and I was running somewhere and I fell and bang a big old lump came up on my head and my mother said what have you done now come here and she put some stuff on it now get out there and don't hit your head anymore well you don't do that to a little girl do you huh you hold them close you say it's all right baby don't worry it'll all go down again but little boys are supposed to skin themselves and act stupid that's why they're little boys and then when they come in, they smell. That's what they do. They're sweaty and smelly. Sodom and Gomorrah is what we're living in. And unfortunately, the church, who is supposed to represent God, is silent for the most part. I'm fortunate because I get to encourage the remnant. I always manage sooner or later to bring up the subject of the gospel with somebody, even in a fishing boat. I led the young fellow to the Lord who helps me out on the boat. Can't use him anymore right now, but never mind. He invited some guy on board the boat who was a Baptist who somehow found out that I was involved in ministry. I don't tell people anything because I want to be left alone unless God prompts me who succeeded in the next hour and a half of embarrassing himself with misquoting scriptures and talking about the jab, the jab, don't get the jab, it's, it's the devil, it's the devil. And I said, now, I'll answer some of your questions. And after about the fifth time of asking the same stupid questions, I said, look, don't ask me any more questions because you don't do what I tell you. Don't listen to what I'm saying anyway, so don't waste my time and yours because you have no understanding of what you're talking about. And I thought, this is the church. We're too busy trying to impress everybody on how spiritual we are. In the meantime, you just conf you've opened your mouth and confirmed the fact that you're a blithering idiot. I call them educated idiots. Now, the immorality which was rife in Sodom and Gomorrah pervaded every area of their society. And Lot, who was supposed to stand up for the things of God, as he had been taught by his uncle Abram, chose rather to live in an environment like that where he had to stand up for his beliefs in Jehovah God or keep his mouth shut and stay in the city gate. And these perverts in the city, and we're surrounded by perverts today, these perverts in the city 
got angry at us. Who made you a judge over us? That was a perfect opportunity to say, God, and I judge you for your perversions and your immoralities and your disgusting lifestyles. Oh, I can't do that now because you're, you know, you're anti-gay. I, I, I've never been pro-gay. I'm not a gay kind of guy, in case you haven't noticed. I'm very happy to be married to a woman. Thank you very much. I can't even... Norval Hayes got up one time and let it rip. I won't I'll repeat what he said, but it, it was rather graphic between two men. He was... And, and, and everybody... Oh, 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 oh. And Norval said, well, that's what they do. It's disgusting, isn't it? But that's what they do. And you're watching ads today and... Uh, One's obviously, and the TV ads and the talk shows. You sound like you're anti LGBTQPTCC. Yes, I am. Yes, uh huh. I like being a heterosexual male. Any men in here like that? I think ladies like it too, don't you, ladies? You want know, to be married to a wimp, a limp, limp wristed. Oh, but this is where we're going they have to do this in order to take you over you have to be made to feel as if you are an outcast I'm telling you what God told me he is looking down and has seen what is going on in this country and he is very angry about it why hasn't he stepped in and destroyed it like he did Sodom and Gomorrah? The tipping point has not yet come. Now you understand this, that I quoted Amos, that God doesn't know, he reveals the secret of his prophets first. The angels came to warn Lot and his family who had connected bloodline with Abram, God's going to destroy this city and need to get out of here. And God could not destroy it until he'd left. Right? Now the body of Christ is held together by the church, the remnant church, the true church, or those who are coming into the kingdom. And God has reserved for you a place of salvation, not judgment. But the church has to be, first of all, listen to me, separated from its hostile environment. And while we continue to be like Lot and sit in the gate and on the council members of the unrighteous and the wicked and say nothing about their stand for God, it's only by the grace of God that you get to be removed before God brings judgment on this country. Now the separation doesn't have to be removal out of the planet. It can just be a separation of moral values, a separation of spiritual values, a separation of, of all the things that you know as a Bible-believing Christian are worth standing for. But most importantly, my message to you today is that you make a stance and open your mouth up. Witness to those people around you. Are you ashamed of the gospel? Do you know there's people going to hell around you because many people are frightened to say, I know that you are acting a homosexual lifestyle right now. I've got to tell you something about it. It has a horrible ending. We've even got them instituted in our government. Buddha check. Talks about taking marital leave. He happens to be the female of the party, which he means he takes it. In our government. Now that's sitting in the seat of government. Now, serious questions about the Clintons. There are serious questions about a lot of these people, their secret lives. This is not a swamp anymore, it's a cesspool. Who's going to make a difference? You? When they came out of Egypt, 
They brought a lot of Egypt's ideas in their head. When they were looking around, they said, they, we, need, we need water, we need a thirsty, we're thirsty, we're thirsty, and this water is bitter. And they said, cast in a rod, cast in a stick, symbolic of the cross. Cast it in there, and the waters were made sweet so that they could drink it. Cross of Jesus Christ is the thing that makes life bearable in this unbelievably corrupt society in which we live. Not just attendance in a church pew. And now I'll start my message now, okay? I love this, Matthew 28, verse 20. Jesus says, and lo, I'm just repeating what the Holy Ghost put on my heart to tell you. And lo, I am with you always. Now, you've heard that scripture many times. Even unto the end of the world, Aeon. When the whole world system crashes, it's not your Christianity that holds you together. It's Jesus Christ himself. Now, I want you to think about that. Because when anytime people say, oh, he said he'd never leave me. That's the power of the Holy Spirit. That's just a small part of it. The big revelation of that scripture is, I am with you. Not just my spirit. I am with you. He's alive. He intercedes on behalf of his beloved. His hands are always outstretched. You say, we have the Holy Spirit, we speak in tongues. Well, good for you. Satan can, Satan can emulate all of these gifts. And he does even so more increasingly in these last days because false prophets are the next big wave to come. Jesus said, look out, they're coming. They're in training right now from the devil. In fact, somebody sent me an article about... Uh, the satanic church is now coming out of the closet wanting to file reparations against Christians. I tell you the truth, I'd kill them all. It's a terrible pastor saying that, right? I'd line them all up. Every single one of these perverts that's in our government, they'd be gone. But you're going to have to have a strong leader to do that. We had one. Now we have a senile old man. Unfortunately, I feel sorry for him. But he's not the president. He failed to be president a long time ago. I call him... D.C. Cabal. There's a group of corrupt, demonically led people who are pulling the strings. And they need to go. Yeah. Every lying, filthy little person of them, they need to go. Amen. Now I'll tell you, it's only a matter of time before the judgment of God comes upon these people. I'll leave that in his hands. I know what I would do if I had the power to do it. But I don't see these people breathing much longer. We'll see. I personally pray for their removal. Now looking back at the early church, Ananias and Sapphira, that's exactly what happened there, right? Why have you chosen to lie to God, to the Holy Ghost? Why have you chosen to lie? And their hearts stopped. They just dropped dead. Mm. Problem solved. But oh no, now we want to elect them to government. I said to somebody this morning, he said back to me, the mama bears are being provoked. Yeah. You start starving their babies, look out, mama bear's going to come at you. She's not going to stop until you're a bleeding mess. Go get them, ladies. Thank God for women that have tenacities, put it that way. Lo, I am with you always. Right now, in the midst of this Sodom and Gomorrah, God is sending his angels. Yes. 
this gift is a weird thing, you know. I mean, I was in the other day trying to get some wings because Cheryl likes chicken wings. There's one place down there that makes great chicken wings. So I go there and I couldn't keep my eyes off one woman that was serving there, not, not in that sense, but was bothering me. Because one of the other waiters kept looking at her in a very bad way. I mean, and I felt like a daddy all of a sudden. I don't know why. He just... So she came over to the table, asked me, blah, blah, blah. And I said, you know that guy in the blue shirt over there? She said, yeah. Not this one. <laughs> she said, yeah. I said, he spends more time looking at your rear end than he does in your face. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I, and here's, here comes the gift. I said, you're engaged, aren't you? And she said, yeah. I said, well, then if you're engaged, why do you even entertain somebody like that? You should be engaged in your heart. Then I said something very weird. Do you believe in angels? And her eyes got like that. I didn't tell her I was an angel, but I was a messenger, right? So then I said two, other three, two or three other things. She said, keep going, keep going. I said, no, that's all I have to tell you. So people out there are hungry. They're, nobody's telling them anything. Nobody's standing up for the right. Nobody says to a young girl, don't let a boy look at you like that. Have respect for yourself. You just meet somebody you want to lie down and get pregnant. And what's the matter with you? Ladies, you have that power to say no. So say no. Men can be very persuasive. It's one of the things I said to her. All men are liars. Because not all men are liars, but you know what I'm talking about, ladies. They'll tell you anything you want to hear. Second thing I said to her was, men are like dogs. They're no good until you train them. She laughed. But she'll never be the same. Because now her little mind is thinking, tick, 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 tick. I lead people to Christ not because I'm obligated, because I care. Some of them continue to care. Some of them fall by the wayside. I'm sorry to say. But their blood is not going to be on my hands and it cannot be on yours, my brother and sister. Open up your mouth and say something. Don't think about it. Say it. If God has empowered you with the knowledge, use that knowledge to help people by putting it into motion. Wesley carries a firearm because that's his symbol of authority. He's trained to use it. He's disciplined in the use of that. Like a police officer. Well, your weapon is the word of God. It's no good in the holster. Even Wes will tell you, you don't pull a gun on someone unless you're planning on using it. Am I right, Wes? Don't threaten me with anything. If you pull it out and threaten me, you better use it. Look what's happening in Chicago. You've got a homeless, a lesbian mayor running the place. A lesbian mayor. Bulgy eyes. Ugly. I mean, I ugly. Oh, boy, you really got to get some hate speech today, Pastor. I don't care. Bring it on. But if I get to the point where I've had enough of your foolishness, don't be surprised if I spin around and put my finger in your face. I did that once last week. The guy shut up. He just, he, he just he shut down. Because there was something about when He said, when you pointed your finger at me, it's like I got hit. Satan is scared of you. Amen. It's like I'm scared of this octopus thing. He's scared of you. You have so much going for you. Why do you put up with stupid? Why do you put up with inequalities? Why do you put up with foolishness which is right in front of your face? Oh, I don't want people not to like me. You want God to love you or you want the devil to love you? Choose you this day who you will serve, yeah? 
And it's important because this body has got to be built up again in activated faith. Faith is an action verb. It's not a passive verb. If the ushers would come, please, and present the offering opportunities to our patrons today. And if you're at home, please consider the scriptures as I share them with you today regarding the offering. Because I rather love the fact that Jesus makes some statements quite often along this line. He says, there's a text on the screen there to tell you what you can do to participate if you're at home which I depend upon and this ministry depends upon and those who work in this ministry depend upon because that's you help pay their salaries. I'm not worried about me. You never have worried about me. God takes care of me. I'm hoping that every single one in this auditorium today recognizes that God is the one who is keeping... I'll get you the announcements in just a second. God is the one that's keeping you afloat. Not one of the members of IGO who are activated members, gone through the classes and so on, should be without work. If you're without a job, then you need to come down the front and say, pray for me, I need a better job. God must open the door. He must open the door. He's made, the Father has promised. He will never leave you, Jesus. I will never leave you. It might seem like, but he says, I can't leave you. I'm joined to you. My blood flows through your veins. Amen. Two words that I want you to do a little study on, and the other words are this, to provoke and to intervene. This is what God we're going to be talking about next week. My little octopus decides it wants to go somewhere else. <laughs> My little octopus. That's what I call this thing. To provoke, to call into action, to arouse, to excite, to excite, to stimulate, and to increase, to challenge. These two things we're going to be talking a lot about in the next week or two. The second word is the word intervention. Provoking the intervention of God. Intervention, the assistance of persons between persons. Interpositioning, mediation, any interference that may affect the interests of others. Ah, ah, I like that. Interposition of favor in favor of another. God stepping in to make possible for you which would be impossible without Him. Ask that your joy may be full, right? Now, this is what Jesus had to say about... <laughs> so many good things here. In Matthew 9, 27, it said, When Jesus departed, two blind men followed him, crying out, saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. See, the church needs to be doing more of that. You and I need to be doing more of that. Have mercy on me, Father. My wife's sister is a little intercessor. And whenever she prays, she always says, Father, have mercy on him. Oh, have mercy on us, Father. Deliver us from the wickedness. Grant me the ability to clear and decree the things that God says are right and to deny the things that are evil. Cause my mouth to be as the pen of a ready writer. Let our spirits be joined together in this house as one united family against evil. Guide us, Father, with these coming elections. We're not asking to elect right people. We're asking to, to elect righteous people. People that will return this country for a season back to its rightful roots. Help us to be intervenous in the lives of others and not just to let them walk on by. When you prompt us, Father, provoke us. Not just prompt, provoke us, Father, to be ambassadors of the kingdom, to challenge those that we say we care about in the ways of God, to challenge ourselves in the ways of God. 
there's young ladies that are listening to me here that really need to reassess your sense of what's right and wrong. Don't compromise yourself because you're lonely. Don't be lonely. Draw close to Christ. Let him be your daddy and your husband or whatever it is. Ladies have that ability, that choice. Men are like little doggies. Sometimes you need to train your little doggies. Provoke us to intervene. Jesus said this. These blind men following him. Jesus, son of David, have mercy, have mercy, have mercy. The disciples were telling him to shut up. Jesus turned to them and said, Do you believe that I am able to do this? <sighs> what a huge statement that is. Do you believe I have the power to heal you right now? Am I able to do what I promised you I would do? They said to him, yes, Lord, we believe. And the result was he touched their eyes, saying unto them, according to your faith, let it be unto you. The church needs to arise. You need to arise. I need to arise. We all need to stand up as a one united front against evil in this church. In this house of God. Those of you out there watching this, you need to be a part of this movement. Can't sit at home in your lazy boy saying, oh, it's terrible what's going on. It's terrible. The next time you cross somebody's life who's shipwrecked, say something. I don't even have to preface it with saying, look, I don't want to offend you. Because I probably will. But I'd rather offend you and see you alive, your name recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life than to not offend you and see a life walk by my life and on their way to disaster. Yes. If it's within your hands to do good, the Bible says do it. And think about it. Talk about it. Write books about it. Do it. You see your children need help? Help them. Pull them out of those corrupt schools they're in. Yeah. Being taught by fascists and homosexuals and yeah. God knows what else. Yeah. Well, what can I do? What can I do? You can pray and ask God to send you somebody who will take care of your kids for you. Yeah. God will send you somebody. Yeah. So, so pay them $5 an hour or 8 bucks an hour, whatever you've got to do to have somebody you love and trust to take care of your babies. They depend on you. Look at that little baby girl. She depends upon mama. She can't depend upon some stranger who doesn't even know if he's a boy or a girl. Amen. Are you kidding me? Amen. Get out of here. You're all fired. Trumpy's lying. You're fired. Final statement. John 6, 5. Check this out. Jesus lifted up his eyes and a great company followed unto him. And he said unto him, Philip... Here he goes with another question. Where are we going to buy bread? So these people can all eat. Next verse. But this he said to test him. For he himself, that is Jesus, knew exactly what he was going to do. Jesus always knows what he's going to do. You don't know. I don't know. Sometimes I don't know all that. You may not know. You may be questioning in your mind as you leave this building today. God help me. I don't know what to do next. Good. He does. Look at somebody and say, Jesus does. He knows. Say it loud. He knows. That's right. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fish. Out of the blue, here comes a kid with some seed to sow. That tells you something about Jesus. Is it, do you believe I can do this? When it comes to the area of your provision, listen to me carefully now. 
When it comes to the area of your provision in material things, God requires a seed. Now, he could just provide supernaturally. He can do anything he wants to do. But when it comes down to believe ye, I am able to do this for you, Harry, John, James, Frank, Celia, whoever it might be. Do you believe I can do this? Yea, Lord. Then if you believe it, sow your precious seed. Put it in the ground. Prayerfully. And watch what God does. Now his disciples still didn't get it. Oh, what are these few loaves and fishes? Oh, we're going to feed all these people. I'm surprised the Lord didn't turn around sometimes. Just say, oh, shut up. But he didn't because he was the Lord. I would have said it, but he didn't. And it says that he took what the little boy had and broke it up. And every time he broke a piece of bread, it divided. And it kept dividing. <laughs> Amazing miracle. The bread you need, your baby formula you need. Mums, I told you the groceries are going to get outrageously expensive. I'm sorry you're going through hardships. Young boys, young girls, I know you're going through difficulties. I know that's hard for you sometimes to declare your faith in Jesus Christ for fear of being rejected by those that you consider to be your friends. They're not your friends. Make mum and dad your friends. If they're Christians, make mum and dad your friends. Make the church your friends. Seek fellowship, gals, with other women in the body of Christ. I would encourage, I don't care whether you're 25, 35, or 45, seek out other women of faith in the house of God and make them your friends. There's a reason women like to communicate five times more than men with their words. They like to talk. So do it. Your husband's going to sit there nodding his head like... <laughs> Women will listen to you. So you ladies, if you're on your own, find another lady. Take her to tea, take her to lunch. Just go visit. Pick up the phone, call her. Say, well, I've got a problem here, you know. Be better. What do you think? Would you pray with me? That's all God wants you to do. Just put the foot forward and leave Sodom and Gomorrah behind. Amen. Can you say Amen. Well, I'm Robin Hancock, so I'm glad to be back amongst my family. And uh, that's about all I have to say about that until next week.